Whether you've just started teaching or spent decades in the classroom, you know there's always more to learn. But where do you start? Well, here at Hillsdale College, we have the answer for you. Tried and true. A primer on sound pedagogy by Hillsdale College professor Daniel Copeland. In this little book, you'll read lessons from more than 25 years of Dr. Copeland's classroom experience. It's all distilled into 14 easy-to-read chapters on lesson planning, assignments, and classroom management. And it will help you improve your skills and inspire you as a teacher, one of our most important professions. Whether you've been in front of the classroom for years or this is your first year, when you read Tried and True, you'll find something to help you keep improving every single day. You don't need to go at it alone. Let Dr. Copeland's real-world experience encourage you and inspire you. You can get your copy today at hillsdale.edu slash true. That's hillsdale.edu slash T-R-U-E. Thanks for listening. Welcome to the Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education Podcast bringing you insight into classical education and its unique emphasis on human virtue and moral character, responsible citizenship, content-rich curricula, and teacher-led classrooms. Now your host, Scott Bertram. Thanks for listening. The Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education Podcast is part of the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. More episodes at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you find your audio. You also can find more information on topics and ideas discussed on this show at our website, k12.hillsdale.edu. We're joined today by Joshua Villarreal. He is a classical pedagogy trainer with the teacher support team at Hillsdale's K-12. Joshua, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much. It's good to be here. Discussing today school culture and more specifically what good school culture looks like. Tell us a bit first about yourself, your journey to education into teaching, and then how you ended up here at Hillsdale College. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I think my journey with teaching begins in high school. I had two really good teachers, Mr. Jeff Thomas and Coach Matthew McBreerty. Uh, they were AP history and uh, swim coach um, who inspired me when I was when I was young. And I went to college thinking I was going to be a teacher. Um, but somewhere along the way, I decided that I was not going to teach and that I was going to do sales. So I actually spent five um, terrible months as an <laughs> IT recruiter. And it was terrible. And I remember just thinking, I had a friend who was starting to teach and she was telling me that it was great. And so I started thinking about teaching. I quit that job, moved back to Austin. And a friend of mine who my parents have known for a long time told me to come check out the school that his kids go to. And I was kind of skeptical. It was a charter school. I didn't really know much about charter schools. And so when I went to check out Founders Classical Academy of Leander, I was a little bit skeptical, but I was invited to one of these coffee with the headmasters. So mm-hmm. uh, Dr. Katie O'Toole was given a speech on what classical education is, and I was really intrigued. And I went around to see all these teachers. I got to see literacy essentials and actions in kindergarten. I got to see a ninth grade history teacher doing seminars over Herodotus. And I was, I was knew I needed to get into the school in any way that I, I could. I ended up accepting a position in sixth grade when I had planned originally on teaching high school, I wanted to get my foot in the door at at Founders. And I'm really glad that I started off in sixth grade. I've taught some high school about for half of my years of teaching. But sixth grade was such a great entry point because I got to do some things with cl- uh, classroom management and understand what to expect from students in a way that I maybe wouldn't have if I had just started out as a, as a high school teacher. I was three years at Founders Classical Academy of Leander, and then last year I was the dean of students at a school in Austin called Valor South Austin. And then, yeah, now I'm now I'm here. Uh, now I'm here working for the college, working for Dr. O'Toole again, mm-hmm. um, and then working for Becky Lincoln. The I well, could get back to your work as dean, but I am curious that first time that you entered Founders in Leander, as we talk about culture today. What are those things that most specifically stood out to you that you remember about the school, about the students, about the way that school operated? Yeah. Um, when I was there, I think one of the cool things was the – I loved the library space I was in at first. It just felt – it felt esteemed. It felt like this is like a, a place – a good place to be. There's uh, books that had all these classics on them. Um, as I'm walking around or I really remember being in um, – Dr. Hicks was his name. He was – I was in a Latin class with him. 
where I was just observing a Latin class and there was a student who made a joke about a predicate nominative and everybody laughed <laughs> um, and everybody laughed. And I had, I didn't know what a predicate nominative was at that point. <laughs> and it's kind of funny. My demo lesson ended up being over grammar. So I spent like a week just trying to understand what grammar yeah. was. And anyway, but the, that was, those were two things that were kind of exciting to me was just how prestigious it felt, um, how elevated the space felt. And then that the kids were actually so engaged that they can make a joke of something as trivial as a <laughs> grammar as, component. As you progressed and uh, became Dean at Valor South Austin, what, what are those responsibilities that you took on at that time? And how did you communicate your goals with teachers and, and with students across the school? Yeah, that's great. So I got to be have one foot in school leadership and one foot in teaching still when I was a dean. So I taught high, um, high school seniors, like they call it integrated humanities. It's a mixture of literature and history. So I had one foot in teaching still, but I would say the other foot was is deeply in uh, helping helping run the school when it comes to comes to discipline. The way Valor has it set up is that, or that South Austin has it set up is that the dean of students gets a lot of the disciplinary concerns. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got to get to know students really well, especially the students who perhaps caused, yeah, caused trouble for, for, for teachers. And we, I've got to build relationships with those kids, get to know them, get to know them really well. I think the thing as the dean, I felt like that was, was my responsibility to do is say what kind of space the school was going to be. This is going to be a place where we are excited by what we're learning. This is going to be a place where we treat each other with respect. This is going to be a place where we actually get to discover what our noblest aspirations are in ourselves and then pursue them and not do things that get in the way of other people doing that or say mean things that degrade other people's desires or dreams for their for their life. And I think the classical schools have a unique ability to help students start to realize what's the most noble and then also help students realize that their actions can either build each other up towards those that nobility or decrease or move away from it. We want to talk about what good school culture looks like. When you are witnessing or part of a high-functioning classroom, what are the hallmarks that you see? Yeah, that's great. Um, I think that one of the key things that I would ask, I think it would actually good for teachers to ask themselves ends up being, would I be comfortable handing this class over to a sub? <laughs> um, based on how my day-to-day -day classes run, am I 95% comfortable handing this class over to a substitute? And I think that part of getting there is casting a vision. Um, it sounds sort of corny, but um, spending a second to think about, write out, articulate what is a good, what is my, what do I want my classroom to look like? And the vision is probably going to be kind of the same. Whenever mm -hmm. I'm in the classroom, I am getting able to do my job, tell the lesson. Students are coming in in an orderly fashion. They're responding to me whenever I give them instructions and they are doing the, going through the lesson in the way that I've told them to with the warm up. They're answering my questions. There's a joke here and there. I don't think most teachers want to be stiff as boards. Mm -hmm. That's not, and I, I wouldn't want teachers to be, to be, um, to be stiff. And then that they, uh, that there's a good relationship with them, that they're actually like, and then out in the school that they, when they see their teacher, they're excited to see them, even though it was only an hour ago that they last saw, saw that teacher. Um, so I think casting that vision and then the next step from there is end up ending up thinking, what do I actually need to do to make sure that I can have that dream come, uh, make that, make that dream a reality in mm -hmm. my, in my classroom. So that even comes down to thinking like, how am I passing my papers back? Yeah. Um, uh, and there are kind of different philosophies on that, which is crazy. There's a teacher, I <laughs> teacher I work with and she preferred to, them to hand them directly to her so that way she could have a moment of coaching. If the student didn't do their homework the night before, I usually had things, I was a literature teacher. And so I usually had too much to get to in my lesson. And so I wanted them to pass them back as soon as possible so I could start mm -hmm. the teaching, uh, the teaching. Um, those are some things when I think about a high functioning classroom, I think it comes down to thinking about what you want that to look like and then really going, looking into the details for how you want that classroom to run. 
Talking with Joshua Villarreal, who is a classical pedagogy trainer with Hillsdale's K-12, about what good school culture looks like. Now, teachers of all different kinds of personalities are successful, and, and students love them for different reasons, the high-energy teacher or the very serious, learned teacher. So there are different ways to get the job done. But when it comes to culture and creating that in the classroom, are there some universal qualities that perhaps you'd like to see no matter what the style is in the classroom? Hmm. That's a really good question. I think that last year when I was at, at Valor, there was a, one of the other, so he's an assistant headmaster. I was the dean of students. He and I both taught the same uh, kind of class, integrated humanities class. And yeah, I think I tended to be on the side of things that were a bit louder. My personality was a bit more like, oh, this is the place it's going to be. But also, he was a lot more relaxed. Mm -hmm. um, he had a much more relaxed temperament in his teaching style. But I think that the thing that he and I shared between our different personalities was the expectation that they would still do what we what we asked. And I think the way we got there was a little bit different. You know, if the kids were talking, he would definitely call students out if uh -huh. he needed to. But also, he was more inclined to wait for them to be quiet and then for them to realize. He kind of had the gravitas that they could notice that he was waiting on them and then sure. they, would, they would respond where I probably have less patience than that. And I like to say, no, we're going to, we're going to move on now. You know, we're, we're not talking or we're moving past that, you know? So yeah, I think that the, in terms of universal expectations, I think in some sense, the, if the result is the same, there's a couple of different paths mm -hmm. to getting to, to that result. And I think taking an account of your temperament is important for that. We talked earlier about the hallmarks of a high-functioning classroom. I'm also curious about the hallways. When <laughs> students are moving between classes, when students are arriving for the day, when students are departing for the day, in a school with good culture, what do those hallways look like? Oh, this is a great question. Each school has its own little tips and tricks. So even Valor uniquely was in a setup where it was uh, the upper school hallways were a large square. And so it was kind of funny trying to figure out, you could say walk on the right, but there actually isn't a most efficient way at any point to uh -huh. get to somewhere else unless it, the door was right next to it. So anyway, every school has got their own kind of tips and tricks. Uh, founders, it was a little bit easier, but more traditional where students could walk on the right side. Um, but even then you've got lockers, kids in lockers, mm -hmm. and you're having to walk past all these things. And then I had the annoying expectation that students would stand in the hallway and wait for me to come in and, and greet them. So I think there are some... Um, or I think that was a connection or a uh, expectation that a lot of teachers, most teachers had. So it ends up having some kind of organized chaos. But I think that, yeah, I think that what you'd still like to see is that students are trying to get where they, where they need to go. And the other part of good hallway management too is teachers just being there. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in some of the necessary chaos, a teacher being out in the hallway and making sure people are getting where they need to go is, is very helpful. What are some potential pitfalls for a teacher where there's not enough order? Hmm. This is a great question. And I think that one of the things that some teachers, oh, it's, I've talked about temperaments and I like thinking about teacher temperaments quite a bit because every temperament has virtues that are natural to it and other temperaments and those same temperaments have certain vices or just things that, that are sort of deficient. And so sometimes there are some temperaments that actually need to move towards a different kind of virtue that doesn't come naturally to them, which mm -hmm. is being strict. <laughs> right. Um, it actually is okay to be strict and to start off the year strict. I think that's my general advice for most teachers is that to start off with high expectations for students to maybe even be unsure that you like them a hundred percent. Like they maybe they know that like you're in their court, but not um not that you're buddies with them. And I think sometimes it's hard to see, especially for a first year teacher, that the work of teaching is one class is a, is a year long. It's a year long process. And so the f rapport you'll have in fourth quarter is very different than what you'll have in the first. And, right. Uh, especially last year. I mean, it's, there were some teachers who didn't take this advice. And then in the fourth quarter, they've got the most amount of detentions because they didn't start off where they needed to be. And I think that even though that's hard to hear and to know that you're challenged in such a way that I actually have to discipline, I actually have to step in to the drama of human life, of a teenager's life and, and assign consequences. The faster you can do that, the better you'll be in the long term. If a teacher is not following that recommendation, it might lead to 
discipline problems in some way. That might lead the students to your office last exactly. year <laughs> at Valor. How do you leverage a discipline policy or the way you discipline students into improving overall culture at a school? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things that students care about is that seeing that the rules are fair. And so one of the things that I really love about Founders Classical Academy, it's it sounds counterintuitive, but it had a lot of ways for teachers to discipline students. And while that maybe sounds oppressive on the one hand, <laughs> it actually communicates to students that not every sin is the same. Mm -hmm. And Founders does a great job at Oh, there's a 30 minute detention. There's a lunch detention. There's an hour long detention. You've got poor behavior slips and those things can add up to something else. It allows teachers to be prudent and to think about what's the offense um, and does every kind of offense merit the same kind of kind of punishment. I don't think that's the case. So I think sometimes a discipline system or a discipline system is essential, I think, for communicating to students that that not every crime is the is the same sort mm -hmm. of crime or merits the same sort of sort of punishment. Back inside the classroom, are there other potential problems for teachers where the students are managed and well behaved, but not necessarily engaged? I think normally if that's the case, they're bored. <laughs> I think they're if they're managed and engaged, they are bored and the teacher doesn't necessarily might not have their best interest at heart. And so some of that ends up being uh, the coaching with that teacher tends to be increasing questioning, that they actually need to increase the engagement they have with students. Their planned questions need to be very particular and move from simple up into something complex and maybe even to preference the simple. And then the other side of that ends up being to give them t the students time to think about it. So I love to tell teachers like that to ask a question, tell students to write down their answer, Tell students then to turn and tell their neighbor what their answer was, and then one of those two people to turn and to answer their question. Or you could do, I want everyone to write an answer down, and then I'm going to cold call on some of you. So mm -hmm. oftentimes the engagement there needs to be um, thinking about their questions and how they're getting those responses back from students tends to build engagement. And I think also that teacher needs to remember not to presume that students remember something you said in class a week ago. So if that's important for your lecture to say today, say, hey, remember when we talked about Kleos last week? Well, that's going to be really important today. Mm -hmm. um, and to think about where the students are at with, with that. Final question for Joshua Villarreal as we talk about what school culture, good school culture looks like. The idea of culture, we're talking about it here, but it still can be a little fuzzy nebulous as to exactly what hmm. you're looking for, right? And when we say culture and we have to define it, is there a way or do you have recommendations for maybe tangible goals or accomplishments that a school can work toward during the course of a year? In terms of building culture? Yes. Um, so I think the first thing is not to overthink it. The word culture just come, means cultivate. And what are we cultivating in a classroom is a human being. And so, I mean, Aristotle's going to have that human beings are made to think and to speak. And then we've probably practiced as another thing too. And so I think if a school stays with those three things in my classroom, are students thinking um, and asking enough questions? Are they speaking in class appropriately? And then do we have time to practice that skill? I think that's a really great beginning step to building something like a culture in a school that's not overthinking or trying too hard to be something that it's not. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think culture necessarily means paintings on the wall. I sure. don't think culture necessarily means, you know, having quotes from Aristotle everywhere, but it does come down to what are we, what are we doing? And those other things are very helpful for building that environment. Joshua Villarreal, he is a classical pedagogy trainer with teacher support team here at Hillsdale K-12 as we talk today about what a good school culture looks like. Joshua, thanks so much for joining us here on the Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education Podcast. Thanks so much. Good to be here. I'm Scott Bertram. We invite you to like us on Facebook. Search for Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education. You also can follow us on Instagram at Hillsdale underscore K-12. Hillsdale underscore K-12 on Instagram. Thank you for listening to the Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education Podcast, part of the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. More episodes at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you find your audio.